It's time for AgriChat, the official podcast of the Tales of the Agronaut blog and stalwart gaming community, where we talk about stuff and things and the stuff about the things, and sometimes gaming. I'm Belgast, and let's start the show. Hey folks, it's that time again. Time for another episode of AgriChat. This is episode 275. Tonight I'm joined by Ammo. Hello. Ashgar. Happy N7 Day. Grace. Hello. Kodra. What the bus? <laughs> Tam. Happy N7 Day. I mean, it's not really at all, but okay. okay. Look, it's been that since the last podcast anyway. I mean, did... Did anything also, it's not actually... like Bioware remembered, so... Right, right, so did anything actually happen on N7 Day? Bioware said happy N7 Day, and that was pretty much it. There's some cool fan art. Okay, I mean, sure. It's not like there was a, a Dragon Age or a Mass Effect, you know, announcement or anything like that to go along with it. I wouldn't expect and, anything like that, no. And Anthem keeps losing people, so... Let's pour one out to Bioware. Womp, womp, womp. So, uh, yeah, we have a list of stuff to talk about, um, one of which we've bumped around a bunch um, because of people not being able to make it in Versa Vista. Um, the, the D&D campaign, y'all uh, finished that up, and, um, like, the little bit that I tuned in for, like, I quietly sat in channel for a little bit and, and watched part of it, seemed pretty friggin' epic. It was, what, a year and a half? Two years. Two years? Or two years. Okay. Yeah, we played a two-year-long campaign run by Tam, and it was very epic. It was fun to run. I went bigger than I normally do with it. Yeah, you want to talk about some of, like, what your thoughts were going in and, like, what you really were trying to accomplish? Sure. So, like, so pretty much all of my, all of the games I run, I've been, I've been DMing for, like, I don't know, going on 15 years now. Um... And pretty much all of the games that do well of mine have like there's some there's some spark that inspires that kind of drives them. Um, and this one this one was we were talking about Final Fantasy games and just like Final Fantasy tropes in general. And I kind of wondered if I could make a Final Fantasy themed campaign. Um, and so I just like pull in a bunch of pull in a bunch of Final Fantasy tropes, uh, use that as kind of the the basis for what I was doing with plot and storytelling and whatnot. Um, and I and I really wanted one of the things that I've I haven't really done much of is um, build a villain out of whole cloth, because um, a lot of the other games I've run have either not had a particular villain. It's sort of like a situation or a series of events or you know factions that have believable motivations or are like or things that are like nameless problems that aren't really like a person and so i thought i would try to make a villain and because i'm me the villain in question was you know your super super scheming super you know causing problems from the from the get go under a variety of guises. So it's it's very amusing uh, because especially at the end, it was very clear to see how much the villain had been influencing everything going on in the world. Uh, and like, it felt like a lot of... So, so a, a criticism I have about Final Fantasy games is there's a lot of four fourth act turns that seem like completely out of left field like not foreshadowed at all not explained at all not something i can go back to and say aha i see how this was all building this game had that but it felt completely earned my um my fourth act twist which i'd had which i'd had figured out some time before but i wasn't sure exactly when it was going to drop was tpk <laughs> like Everyone dies, but it's not over. Because the uh, the other thing that I'd been doing was I was reading a I, I was reading a lot of uh, I've been reading a lot of like non Western fiction for a while, and there's some really interesting stuff in like the way deities appear in fiction and the idea of like people who become gods and so on and so forth. And I was like, I wonder if I can 
make a setting, turn a bunch of players loose on it, give them like a crazy amount of power over the course of the campaign to like reshape the entire world and then see what that campaign world looks like afterwards. And so like over the course of the campaign, everybody ascended to deity status and then fought the god of conflict. Yeah, and like the 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 character progression was really cool. Like we all started just as a group of adventurers on an airship, which is sort of like, oh, we're in a Final Fantasy game. There's airships, there's all of these standard Final Fantasy tropes. Uh, but immediately there's an assassination and we're going to deal with that. Like, we need to be the messengers to let somebody know that a royal was assassin assassinated and uh figure out how we go from there like figure out who needs to be told and this we 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 handled pretty well but quickly we got ourselves on this path to bigger things a lot of cool reveals like finding out that one of the old gods that well one of the gods that everyone sort of thinks went silent was actually being held prisoner we managed to free her and then from there, the campaign really opened up as we sort of went around doing, like, it felt like a Final Fantasy game in the sense that we had this big map of blinking things and we were flying our airship all over trying to figure out what was going on. But yeah, like, the God of Conflict reveal was really cool, especially when we real I I realized that he was the guy, or everyone realized he was the guy that was, like, really the antagonist of every single thing that we had run into. Uh, and my character uh, wildly changed his theology explicitly so that he could be an antagonist to the God of Conflict. And it was very funny and very fun to play. It was a super neat, it was a super neat take that I really, that I really enjoyed watching like play out. Cause I wrote the whole, I wrote some um, like mythology pre-game and it was really and it was written i tried to write it as close to like a um you know like something you'd read in a holy book somewhere or like in a children's like in a children's bible or something um as close as i could get and so it was like intentionally sort of mythic and vague and also tremendously inaccurate but it was fun seeing the inaccuracies get revealed over time because i i my intent from the start was to be able to rewrite that with both new characters and a chain and changed history, depending on what what was discovered and what they decided to do with it. So that the written tome basically acts as a unreliable narrator. Yeah, it was incredibly unreliable, but we didn't know that when we started the game. Yeah, I just presented it as this is this is the history as people know it. And the uh, the wheel started to come off when they met an actual god from the stories, and she was like kind of weirded out by the whole people worshiping worshiping her thing, and was also not really like how she was portrayed. Yeah, she was pretty okay with rewriting the books. I had a ton of fun with that. Um, I was really glad, Ammo, that you were playing a cleric of her because <laughs> it it worked so perfectly. Yeah, that was that was actually pretty cool, and it was, yeah, uh, trying to figure out how a cleric would act, like actually meeting her goddess would be, and just how weird things get really fast. Yeah, well, and also because like because you're a, at the point at which you're a cleric, you have certain expectations of your deity, and when your deity is like, at full disclosure, my. My character inspiration for this deity, who I bill as the goddess of magic, beauty, and the sea, and she is all of those things. But the but the baseline, the like the baseline that I was using was like I mean, no Ariana Grande meets like um, Sarah Silverman, <laughs> and that's and that's not a combination that you that probably makes you think like oh yeah you know dignified goddess. It's more like, wait, she's she's kind of into going partying and has a pretty irreverent look at a lot of things that make a lot of other people kind of wonder. She was a really, really fun character to play because it was really it was really it's really fun to balance 
on the surface, okay, yeah, sure. She's like chill to the point of insouciant. She's pretty irreverent and like has that has that kind of problem where no one and no one for a very long time has told her she needs to stop doing things and so she'll just do whatever she thinks is funny <laughs> yeah and like and like who's gonna tell her no like nobody even though they should nobody um like party included for quite a while would just like go along with go along with whatever terrible ill-advised thing she was planning on doing or thinking about doing or had a vague whim for doing because it's like uh, we don't want to talk back to like actual literal goddess. Yeah, I think uh, one of the parts I liked uh, the most, especially early on, was like the first time we took her to one of her temples. Oh yeah, and, and, she, was, <laughs> and she was like, "Uh, this is actually creepy," which I I feel like it would be. Oh, you definitely. Know, you wake up not knowing what people have done in your absence, and you find that somebody has made like buildings and statues of you and has your picture in a million books that they and like literal shrines and like that seems like it would be creepy uh and at the same time she um at the same time she has like she's also really really smart and is is operating on some just like really obscure levels because she has i mean she's a she's she's super bright and has a bunch of like world spanning projects going on and whether or not they're all good ideas is a different story. I mean, some of them are explicitly bad ideas, but who is going to tell her not to? Exactly. And, and I mean, eventually us, but that took us a long time. It did. Well, and that was the thing. That was that was the progression that I thought was really, really cool was watching, like, watching everybody in the party slowly get around to, like, wait a second, hold on. You know, go from, like, odd, terrified followers to like peers or better and I, I and i distinctly remember like my one of my one of my the moments that really stuck out to me was bad stuff happens to the party they're all killed and come back she doesn't know that's what happened and gets really worried about it and it didn't occur to anybody it didn't occur to anybody in the party until later that she would like oh she's in hiding because she thought we fought and lost and had no way of knowing otherwise. I mean, it wasn't entirely inaccurate. It's true. I mean, we did fight and we did get TPK'd. We just managed to, you know, take the guy with us. Blow up the entire building. Yeah, this was a very suit... Like, all of the consequences were very big and epic in this game. Which was cool. It was it was fun to do. Because it was like, I, I don't... I'm, I went into it with this, like, I don't actually care about preserving like the sanctity of the setting like the whole point is that the whole point of the whole thing is that players come in and make a huge mess of it and we see what comes out the other side so like big stuff happens like big sweeping changes happen and it's kind of cool to see it's probably a setting that i'll reuse i'm looking forward to it i i i especially cared a ton about how my character would be perceived in the future yeah, that was that was also really interesting because I because you saw that you saw how it how like various things were viewed and how inaccurate they were and spent a lot of time making sure that you were recorded accurately. Yep. Other players did not. Nope. And that's and that'll be interesting. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> but it's really fun. It's really fun putting together a big. I hesitate to say sandbox because it's not quite that, but just a big toy box to mess around with and see see what happens. And like, I don't need to be, I, I'm not super attached to the story. There's a few parts that I think uh, I think I would do differently. Um, there, are, there, are, there are a few characters that I feel like I didn't introduce well enough to really ha have them have the impact that I intended. Such as? The... The whole, like, the, the Grand Marshal and his daughter. I, I anticipated, I, what, I, what I didn't anticipate in a retrospect should have was the, the party's, like, single-minded, we are going to go without stopping to go report this. We're not even going to stop to, like, clean up. We're not going to do anything. We're going to go straight here, show up, like, late in the day, and, you know, looking like hobos to deliver our important message. 
And it meant that there was no space for me to be like, hey, here's what you're getting into. Here's a conversation you overhear. Here's what people are saying at a bar. Oh, yeah. Um, it's also one of the bigger parties that I run with. I normally run with like four or five, and this was seven. And I There's a bit of an adjustment when you've got a party that big. Oh, yeah. Well, on this party, was it was it seven total or was it more than that? And we just had people like in and out. It was more than that. It yeah. Aver- yeah. It averaged seven. Yeah. It was seven, it was six most of the time. It w- Yeah, it was six for a lot of it. It was up, it was up as high as nine at one point. I think the first session was nine, but I don't think we had any yeah. more that were that high. Yeah. But yeah, it was, a, it was a ton of fun to run. It was, it was fun to write. I, I, I always love seeing what people do with it. Um, it's the, because I, this is my creative outlet and I can't seem to stop. Um, I'm a goodly ways into planning the next one, which is going to be a lot more grounded. Um, but hopefully it'll be interesting in different ways. I'm excited for it. I'm going to miss having an airship. So you want to be a hero. <laughs> Definitely yeah, going to miss the airship. My um, my inspiration for this one is classic point-and-click adventure games, which is ironic, considering that those are based on D&D themselves, or at least the, the main one that I'm using. So I guess we're coming full circle. But that one, not entirely sure how we're going to end up doing it, but it's either going to be two parties running the same campaign in parallel, which I think is going to be an interesting like parallel universes kind of thing, or two parties starting in different parts of the same world and possibly affecting one another. Because I that sounds that all that that concept has always fascinated me, and I kind of wanted to try doing it with this this most recent campaign. It didn't quite work out. I mean, it worked out a little bit. It did. There were a few things that that happened in the background. I distinctly remember accidentally giving the other party a quest. Yep. Which they promptly ignored, apparently. It's, yep, also true. Uh, I'm, so the next campaign we're starting to look at Pathfinder 2 for. I am having a ton of fun building characters in Pathfinder 2. I'm really hopeful it's as much fun to play as it is to build characters in. I agree. It's it's it is a lot less accessible than D and D five, but it gives you a lot of it gives you a lot more tools by, with which to make your own character and make your character yours even at first level, which is cool. You can get into like you can get into themes really really well, and you don't have that like I feel the same as every level one wizard thing. I mean D and D in a lot of cases, doesn't let you make significant decisions at level one, and you make your last significant decision at, like, level three. Yeah. Unless you are multi-classing. Sure. Which I know there's a bit of disagreement over, in because I tend to think multi-classing in five is a... It, it's not a foolproof way of increasing your power, but it's definitely a strong way. If you're do, If you're using it right, that's the way you get out of bound. Like, if your campaign is going to level 5 or 6 or 7, yep. you can probably be stronger as a multi-class character than a single-class character. Mm-hmm. I and mean, that's that, it starts to even out a bit. Well, so even there in this game, like I multi-classed one level, uh, I dipped into Cleric, and the stuff I picked up from dipping into Cleric was pretty significant. I mean, it got me access to heavy armor, shields... And uh, a frankly ludicrous buff to healing that should not be available to bards who have access to the best ranger healing spell. <laughs> yeah, that's that's one thing that I think is really interesting in Pathfinder 2, which is different from a lot of forms of D&D and Pathfinder 1, which is in a lot of ways the same na- the same kind of the same game in name only. Mm hmm. Uh, the guardrails on power level are way stronger in Pathfinder 2. And I like that. Like, the if you sit there with every possible piece of source material and, you know, graph out expected outcomes and work out the absolute highest tier powerful character you can possibly make, you're going to be, like, 10% better than... The average you're also going to be very very specific on achieving certain conditions 
Yeah. So it's like you're going to be, you're going to, yes, you can come out ahead of other people, but you're going to have to engineer situations in order to really shine. And it's not going to be the thing where it's like, I'm a, I'm an optimized wizard and I am like four parties by myself. Like I'm, I'm singularly more powerful than both the rest of my party combined three or four times over because the wizard and stuff like that. And I think that's a good change. I do too. But we'll also see where that all goes. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Also, uh, special thanks to Incario, Quinn, Airy. Oh, I lost my credits. Everybody who did, who commissioned art, uh, who, who I commissioned art from. Uh, I've been I've been commissioning art for my D and D games recently, uh, and I really, 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 really like the results. Like, I feel like they, I feel like it helps. I feel like it helps like with the storytelling, and also is really cool. And in this case, I commissioned the final boss, and having like a custom sprite, a custom like terrifying sprite as the final boss is just like a great feeling. That was really cool. I need to practice my, I need to practice my, uh, my cued monologue timing though. I got my, I I got my death monologue timed really nicely though. (laughs) Like Like, a turn before it died. Also a turn before we were all going to die. We, we, we really pulled that one out of there. (laughs) The, The last fight did a sufficient job of running, I think, everyone out of resources. It was quite amusing. Yeah, I think that was right. I think I think you beat that boss literally the turn before people were going to just start dying, which IMO is the perfect place to be. I so the the character I eventually did was so as it was alluded earlier, it was the god of conflict was who we were fighting and so I was like, okay, what is the opposite of a god of conflict? And so I basically transformed my identity to be a god of peace. I forsake any weapons and anything that could possibly deal damage in my spell list. And it was really cool playing like the most hardcore denial wizard you can be. Like I was I was sitting there and I was uh mostly saying no to the enemies. I was being a blue mage in D&D and it was really fun while also being a healer. I was I was very azorius yeah it was it was really neat to see that to see that in play because yeah you, just, you had zero damage output but it's fine except you, against the you last were the boss. fun police i i was absolutely <laughs> the fun police and the final boss was designed around it the fi- the final boss was designed with an ability that was that was uh kodra is going to counterspell this every turn or every round this is the thing that gets counterspelled because if it ever doesn't, it's bad. It didn't get so it didn't get counterspelled. I think three times, and it was very bad. <laughs> uh, Grand Cross. If you're familiar with Final Fantasy games, in addition to being horrible in Final Fantasy games, is real awful in D and D. Yeah, it is. It is uh, my one regret that it isn't a game played around the table is that I don't I didn't get a chance to uh, to enjoy the expressions on my players faces when I say when I ask for a uh, strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom and charisma save. I think that's about when I tuned in because <laughs> like, oh shit. Yeah, it's it's not good. People turning in the frogs. People turning into stone. People turning into stone frogs. And you are a stone and are a frog. I mean, it's what that spell does. That spell sucks. I think it was Alien that was like a a frog and stone. There was another thing that it cast that I also managed to counterspell that was very important. The anti-divinity. The, like, disjunction that would have turned off all our powers. Yeah, that would have been bad. Um, It also... It also... I was also able to settle a bet with... uh, with another DM friend of mine. How many Ockmorns can a boss cast before a D&D party figures out what to do about it? I think it was three. <laughs> yeah. Well, the problem was there were... The problem was there was Ockmorn, which was a problem. But there was also the Magitech Missiles, which was also a problem. And so both of those mechanics were working against each other. It's like a Final Fantasy boss. Yes. 
I actually did. I actually did the entire D and D final boss design around FF fourteen bosses. Um, it worked surprisingly well. Like it was a, the the boss fight was incredibly simple and very very simple to run, which was important for something like that at this stage of the game. But effective, <laughs> and nobody fell off. Yeah, no, I I tried really hard. You did almost fall off. That was yeah. <laughs> Gotta watch out for those tidal waves. Yeah, well, yeah, well, much like in Final Fantasy XIV, um, they're not always my friend, and I don't always know. catch them in time. <laughs> this is fair. <laughs> but anyway, it was it was a really fun game to run. I really, I'm really glad that people had fun with it. It was a very fun game to play. Yeah, absolutely. This was my first actual real D and D game, so like I was terrified at the start, but um, I really enjoyed it, and I know. At some point, I definitely am looking forward to playing some more. <laughs> yeah, it was definitely, uh, this was a, a wild divergence from a lot of D&D games, but I, I would I would love to play with you again. It was really fun playing with Issa. Yeah, and like, I was really like, you know, worried about not knowing how to do stuff, but you guys made me feel very comfortable and like I didn't have any problems like asking questions and stuff like that so i really felt like i could get into it and really enjoy myself i'm glad so in other happenings there was apparently a big warframe patch there was a big warframe patch they finally patched in the second half of their new melee system which mostly involved a rework of how the combo counter worked and a rework of how combos work so they actually make sense now and a new warframe and two warframe rework reworks and the Kuva Lich system, which is totally not inspired by Shadow of Mordor at all. <laughs> is which part of it the you like build up a boss part or the something else? It's that part. Okay. They're like, hey, that Nemesis system thing looks kind of cool, and it, I don't think any other games have really borrowed it. So, uh, yoink. Yeah, it was the best part of that game. I mean, it was very interesting, and the rest of Shadows of Mordor were not really. I don't think it's quite as interesting as the implementation in Shadow of Mordor, but still a, still a neat thing that they added. But really, what's take, been more noticeable for me is the Warframe reworks. Uh, poor Ember finally got some love. That's good. So what does Ember do now? Ember lights people on fire, and they die. Okay, but so before, Ember lighted everyone on fire. And then Ish. once you got to level 30, you stopped being able to light things. Stop, things stopped dying when you lit them on fire. Yeah, so... Is it still, like, is she a broad AoE Warframe, or is she more like, I'm going to focus really hard on lighting this one thing on fire? She is very broad AoE. Her one is basically unchanged, except you can cast it repeatedly to multiply its damage. Mm. Like Atlas is one, or several other Warframes with abilities like that. Okay. Her two is new. It is a self-damage taken, uh, it's a damage resist buff. That scales up based on her temperature meter, which is a new thing she has. If it's too high, then you start losing energy. But her three is the same. It's still a radial AoE, and it okay. decreases your temperature meter. So you spend some energy to get some damage. That now removes armor as well. So, And her four just picks ten things in your line of sight and drops meteors on them. Okay. It's not a toggle ability anymore, so you actually need to be pressing the button sometimes. Yep. But it has a very favorable damage formula. It... Because they changed how the heat proc works slightly, it just it just kills things. Spend some energy, kill some enemies. That's good. And her new two keeps her alive for a lot longer than she used to be able to. So while you actually need to press buttons to play Ember now, Ember is much better. That, well, that's very good. Like, a big AoE light things on fire champion is probably what Ember really wanted to be. And not just, I cast world on fire and run around and collect loot. Yeah, like... Actually, pressing buttons is a good thing for a character to have to do. She sounds pretty energy dependent, though. She is pretty energy dependent. That's fine. I'll just always run Trinity. And her four augment is now, uh, if you kill something, it has a 25% chance to drop energy. So that seems that'll keep you net positive. Yeah, that seems pretty relevant because the four is what, 100 energy? Baseline, yeah. I think I have Ember modded for max efficiency, so it's costing me 25 to press the button. Oh yeah, you're definitely energy positive then, as long as you're killing, as long as you're killing like five to ten things. Right. This hasn't been a problem. The other rework I can't speak as much about because I didn't play Vauban before. 
Valbon was weird before. He's weird now, but they also seem to have decided that maybe some of his abilities should do damage. Oh yeah, that would be nice. But also he kept his best CC abilities that he had before. So they combined his old three, which was Bastille, the big giant big giant field of enemies can't move inside this, and his old four, which was Vortex, which sucked everything to the middle. Those are one ability now. You can collapse your Bastille into a Vortex, or vice versa. He kept a bunch of the weird grenades. The one that does damage does a lot of damage. He didn't keep the bounce pad. He got a speed pad instead. I've seen this used for hilarious physics things. I'm not sure how actually useful it is. <laughs> and his old one, which used to be sticky, like sticky Tesla grenades, now travel, like uh, Octavia's thing. So if there's nothing near them, they'll go find some enemies to go shock. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah. And they also decided he should he should have a big AoE. So he just has a satellite laser. Fantastic. Right, so I've been, seeing, I've been seeing a lot of Ember and Vauban in things lately. And then the new form, new Warframe is just Kirby. He eats things, he rolls around, he gets stronger from eating things. Because this is Warframe and not Kirby, he looks slightly more like an Eldritch Abomination. But, you know, or like I said, pumpkin. Kirby. Or looks like a big pumpkin. I guess that's also an option. But this is was this not a patch with, like, a big content addition. They just changed a lot of little things and added the Kuva Lich system. So how does the Kuva Lich system work? You have to kill, like, a... Kuva Thrall, which is a chance to appear in level 20 plus Grenier missions, and then it will be, re- be reborn as an enemy, which will then try to take over parts of the star chart and possibly tax your earnings in those parts of the star chart. And you need a particular set of Requiem relics to kill them, and this is a basically a tier 5 relic. If they kill you, they level up. The primary thing you get from them is a new set of weapons, which are just altered variants of existing Grenier weapons. Mostly they're upgrades, some of them are side grades. Some of them are dramatically better, though. But w- while you have a Kuva Lich, it will, you know, taunt you in the Orbiter and taunt you when you go to go to missions and generally be a personality. That's cool. They did a lot of voice work for this. That's really cool. Initially, this wasn't really as opt-in as it maybe should be because the Kuva Lich will start taking things from you even if you don't have the ability to kill them. But now you no, actually oh, need to uh, basically execute the Kuva Thrall to start, to start it. So if you don't do that, then you won't get a Lich. Oh, it's a really cool system. I have not personally explored it very much. I think that's it for Warframe. So, another thing that's happened since we last recorded a show is BlizzCon. And they announced some stuff to varying degrees of successfulness. <laughs> I mean, they announced some Overwatch deals. I mean, Overwatch 2. <laughs> yeah. So, they, like, we, we had kind of talked about, like, what BlizzCon would look like prior to it happening. And... Like, I assumed they were going to have to say something to open BlizzCon, and they did, in fact, say something. That qualifies as something, sure. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it wasn't exactly a, a apology, and um, no, I don't we're, like... Where sorry people got mad is not exactly an apology. Yeah, I mean, I'm not... I'm really not sure how I feel about it. Um, like, it was a, it was something... And that's honestly more than I thought we would get, but it's also like real short of actually apologizing. Like, yeah, it was insufficient. It like was I, something, but that something was insufficient. Like I, I, I said this in like a long thread on Twitter, but basically, an apology requires like three parts. There is a statement saying that you understand what you did wrong, and a an apology for doing the thing that you just acknowledged that you did wrong, and then some sort of a a plan for not letting it happen in the future. And, you know, this statement was largely missing all of those parts. So the the other problem is there is no story provided that makes any sort of sense. Like they are still very clearly lying. Because their stated thing is, this has nothing to do with the fact that we're doing business with China. That is their position. And, like, China did not influence... Like, the fact that we we care about the Chinese market does not influence our decision here at all. And I'm sorry, but all of the... None of the evidence leads to a a, a story... Where that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, and, and what's kind of come out after this is that 
the the stuff that was released on on social media or like on uh, Weibo, the Chinese social media, was largely done without them being involved because like it it happened overnight. Like when when you know folks in the United States were asleep, and it seems like that was Netty. Which you know for for those who don't know, Netty's is more than just a partner. You know, basically Netty's is the corporate sponsor of blizzard in china for lack of a better term um in order for businesses to do business in china on any kind of a large level they have to effectively be joined at the hip with a chinese company okay but and and netease is basically their partner and that and that's fine like that makes sense i'm i'm less frustrated with that particular element of this but the Who's, whose was the decision to pull down and ban the player in those casters? Was was Nettie's running that? Was that Nettie's decision making? I I think that all happened before, you know, folks in the United States woke up. Okay. Like, I think that all kind of happened prior to things and it's been damage control ever since. There's a really important damage control thing they could do. And Which Kaplan apparently cool. thinks they could do it. But reverse. they haven't done it. Yeah, they they've basically done kind of a half ass reversal. Um, you know, aka they, a not reversal. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, like, so they they lowered the the total suspension time. They you know didn't take away the winnings, but like from what I understand, the winnings had already been collected, so they couldn't have done that anyway. It's it's a quagmire. <laughs> like, uh, I, I'm actually I do understand a little bit more if this is something where. Nettie's made a decision to pull these casters to give them bans, and now it's two companies like fighting between each other behind the scenes. That's actually a story that I can understand. It's a story uh, that like is at least slightly sensible. Yeah, and like this makes sense how we ended up with this miserable compromise where it's like, all right, Blizzard is put like Blizzard US is pushing for no ban time and like everyone like we're going to undo this whole thing and Nettie's is like no the full weight of our ban has to stand and so they end up in the middle here the thing though is there's a super important element of that that is missing which is in order for me to believe that story and and get to some level of understanding i have to trust blizzard mhm mm I have to trust that that I have to trust in all of that that's going on behind the scenes, and they haven't been good caretakers of my trust over time. And like, I mean, and of note, like this is not a statement that has come out. This is just kind of things that have leaked out around the cor the edges. Yeah, well, obviously they are trying to put up a united front because otherwise it looks really bad for them. Um, like, I don't know well, if it looks worse for them. Than their current look. Yeah. I mean, it it might be something that would damage their partnership with NetEase. Yeah, it looks worse for them from a business-to-business -business standpoint. Yeah, I mean, and I'm not sure if ActaBlizz would do anything to damage their potential stance in China. And that's, that's, that's the big problem here, is it's... I don't know. Like, I mean, the whole situation feels frustrating, but on at least on one level, I understand how it ended up like this. So, because like when when you when you stop doing business in China, like you're just stonewalled from doing business in China. So, I I kind of want to work through my feelings because, like, uh, full disclosure, these this is stump stuff that I'm sort of thinking through on the fly, but I think for me. There's a difference between Blizzard is like cap like their first position is to immediately kowtow to like Chinese government concerns versus they are caught in this relationship in which their partner company is a Chinese company that is like their default position is to immediately uh count out to the chinese government's concerns like i can at least understand that like rather than us looking at blizzard usa and them be and them just 
being completely subservient to China, like at least now it would that would make sense from a perspective of we are trying to deal with the best of a really bad situation on our hands. Again, I agree though. They haven't proven that I should trust them like that. I mean, it's a real bad situation and um the I don't know, like there's a lot of frustrations here. Like so BlizzCon happened, there were minor protests during the weekend. Um nothing large really seemed to materialize. Um, you know, based on what I heard from folks that attended, there were thirty, thirty five people out in the the parking lot of the convention center protesting. Um, and then there was various folks on the show floor. Um, that was a whole weird situation is like whoever was doing the cameras was, uh, doing their own subversion there. Um, cause like the camera focused in on a lot of protest t-shirts during the, the length of the show. Um, like there was a couple times where it focused in on free Hong Kong t-shirts. Um, there was one time where like it focused for an extremely long time on a t-shirt that read fire Bobby Kotick. So like, I feel like Blizzard itself is probably boiling under the cover with, you know, employees fighting back against management. But I mean, there's, I guess, I think I mentioned this Kaplan has already said that like, he does not support this company's position on this. That's not great, I guess, considering he's in charge of their probably most valuable current brand. Which yeah. is Overwatch. Overwatch. I mean, I have to wonder how long J. Allen Brack will be president of Blizzard. Just full stop. If he leaves, it won't be because of this. I mean, I haven't seen anything where Brian Kibler is going to be back. Have any of you? No, I haven't. I mean... <sighs> kind of the interesting thing is is like it was it was a fairly large year for you know things announced at blizzcon um all of them seem to be extremely far off yeah so like i mean i i don't know like i've reached a point where basically i'm i'm putting down my pitchfork for the time being so i've been dabbling again with blizzard products um i mean grace and i ran around and did the 15th year anniversary event the other night um and it was it was entertaining it was some nonsense, but it, it wasn't quite misery. I mean, it wasn't 40-player Molten Core at level 100. No, it was definitely not that. It was. I found it entertaining. It was maybe slightly more punishing than it needed to be, but it, it, was, it was fine. It was a reasonable thing for the anniversary. Yeah, so basically it was like three quests that you you did um that involved doing a bunch of raid fights from a specific expansion so like burning crusade or cataclysm or wrath of lich king um and the the problem with that was it was kind of the version of you know ultimate coil where where like you had to basically do all three in sequence and if you screwed up on the last one you had to go back and start it, the first one and do them all three in sequence. So when everybody died to defile on the Lich King as Ooh. as foretold. <laughs> yeah, it was it was kind of hilarious cuz like literally Grace said seconds before that everyone was going to die to the first defile and then it, it flooded the platform and we all died. <laughs> um but like, I guess for me, like the the big thing for BlizzCon was obviously Diablo Four, um, and I'm I'm not sure what I think about it. I'm definitely reserving judgment. Like, there's something it, I can get my hands on. It definitely seems like they're chasing the path of the Exile characters or players. I don't know why they're playing Path of Exile. Right. Like, like they already have a game they like, and from from what I've I've gleaned from that community they're pretty devoted to path of exile um but like a lot of what they talked about felt like oh you're you're basically channeling path of exile um and i guess for me so long as i keep the combat diablo 3 ish which is kind of what it looked like i'm okay with added complexity i don't mind if there's added complexity i'm a little nervous about whether this will be a situation where you will 
have a complicated talent tree that you are locked into and cannot change. Yeah, that that is my concern because that's basically where you ended up in Diablo 2 is, you know, if you did not spec a character a specific way, then you kind of might as well have just started over and spec a brand new character. So what do we know about Diablo 2? Or Diablo, or Diablo 4? 4. <laughs> um, it's dark. It's got open world zones. You know how it's got Diablo, Lilith and she's amazing. You know how Diablo three had too much color? Oh, Apparently too much going color. the other way. Yeah. I didn't, but okay. Apparently that was a thing. Like apparently yeah. Um Lilith is amazing, so we'll just go there. Like Grace said. Lilith is my queen. She's pretty great. And the statue that they had of her was quite gorgeous. Um, like it seems like it's gonna be I like a shared public space area as you're out in the world, um, and there'll be public event type things that happen. Um, so it's going to have PvP. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. Um, yeah. Supposedly there will be like PvP specific areas. As long as it doesn't try to make me do them, I can just continue ignoring that and going about my way. So the the thing that I I saw that made me cautiously optimistic with some some statements to the effect of there will be these world events, there will be dungeons, there will be randomized and non-randomized maps. If you want to tackle these challenges with friends, you can do that. And they've made it kind of clear how that works and how the questing will work with friends. And if you want to do these things solo, you can also do that. So that to me sounded like them saying we're not going to force you to group up to do content, which is, that makes me happy. We will see if they follow through with that. But right now, cautious optimism. I wonder if they will allow PC users to use a controller. I really hope that's a case. Like there, there is talk about crossplay between console and PC versions. They said that that was a goal of being able to crossplay all of them together. Now, of note, like they've not mentioned the Switch at all in this. They've only mentioned that it will release on PC and Xbox and PS4 at the same time. Or specifically they say Xbox and PlayStation. I don't think they they clarified if that's Xbox 1 or if that's Xbox Scarlet or if that's PS4 or it's PS5, but um that they that they want all the the, the releases to happen at the same time and their goal is to have crossplay. And I, I think that is a good goal to have. I would like more crossplay, thank you. I'm I'm less concerned about that and more concerned that the PC client will not support controller. I mean the console version and the PC versions are currently different games. So I if mean, they have crossplay then they would have to not be different games. And I hopefully guess they would fair. allow controllers on them. Yeah. I mean, because honestly, like, that's one of the cool things about Destiny 2 is if you want to play with a controller, you plug in a controller and you get back all of the things that the console has for supporting a controller. If you want to play with mouse and keyboard, you unplug your controller and life goes on. Um, And that all seems to work. Like, I know a lot of people that play Destiny 2 on the PC with a controller and are doing fine against other you know, mouse and keyboard players. So I, I, I think it's, I really think the whole, uh, I don't know, mouse and keyboard versus controller thing is mitigatable. Go back to the last epoch, the last epic devs. God, they're, they are so wrong. They're just (laughs) universally wrong. Like, like, yeah, I'm not going to get into that, that discussion, but like there are, there are key reasons why I, I'm not caring about Last Epoch because they have wrong ideas about action RPGs. Um, yeah, I mean, like, I'm 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 cautiously optimistic about Diablo Four. Um, I'm also interested in Diablo Immortal, and they made no mention of Diablo Immortal, but Shadow dropped a new trailer on the first day. Gee, I wonder why. Yeah, like I mean, that also makes me slightly sad. As much as I was in intensely disappointed by that announcement when it happened i would still i mean i i want to play this game and yeah I, now it's I, sort of getting 
brushed under the carpet. <laughs> I mean, I have a feeling it will kind of just quietly launch at some point. Did I mean, I think I know the answer to this, but um, did did the word StarCraft get uttered anywhere? Nope. Yeah. Right. Nope. There, there was exactly one StarCraft panel. One. And I don't even remember what it was about. I... I think they mentioned that um, they were releasing an Arcturus Manx like announcer pack, but that's it. I I don't know why they hate StarCraft, but apparently they hate StarCraft. I mean, they've forgotten it exists. It didn't even make their most recent financial report. Yeah. They also have largely forgotten that Heroes of the Storm is... So, Heroes of the Storm is a lot more dire. How does... Does StarCraft make money other than uh, selling the box? Sort of. They released a, they released basically a free-to-play version of StarCraft 2 that is piecemeal. I don't know that anyone is actually using it. I mean, yeah, so I, I don't know what the state of StarCraft is. I also have no clue what monetization is going to look like for Diablo 4. I mean, it's going to have mounts and more cosmetic options so that'll be one thing is there going to be a in-game real money auction house no there is not they they came out and said no that will not exist okay they they maybe learned their lesson on that one um i mean heart of stone of course got another expansion i guess or something um meh. i kind of brushed over it earlier but uh they did announce overwatch too they did. They announced Overwatch 2. That was basically the other big announcement, but it's kind of Overwatch 2. It's it's a side-loaded expansion. Yeah. Um, so it's going to be a PvE expansion plus a new game mode, but StarCraft, or like, not StarCraft, Overwatch 1 is also going to be able to play that game mode, I think, is what they said. Uh, Overwatch 1 will get all the heroes and all the maps, but like, Overwatch 2 is purely the PvE stuff, apparently. Which are like story missions, and the story missions will have a fixed number of champions that you can play. Yeah, something like that. It's like Junkenstein's Revenge all year round. And that personally doesn't give me a lot of hope. Like, Junkenstein's Revenge was fun, but I'm not sure if, like, it could carry an entire game. Like, I hope it's more like a Destiny Strike. I think they did say it's supposed to be for like eight characters but um they didn't really have a lot to say about it yet yeah i mean there's some kind of leveling system there's some kind of talent system that gives you a growth path for your character that only works in pve mode i feel like i have concerns i yeah i I don't know really what this is going to be like um but i do think it's kind of cool that if you just want to play PvP maps in Overwatch, you're going to continue to be supported and, like, it will link up with Overwatch 2. And, you know, when you're playing Overwatch 2, you'll keep all of the cosmetics that you got through Overwatch 1. So, uh, yeah, it's it's real arcane in their descriptions of what this is going to be. Um, the people that I talked to that played it on the floor seemed to like it. I mean, they thought it was fun. So... Um, Because I guess they just had like a story map playing on the floor. It was like a four-player story map. I mean, sounds like the kind of setting you can make an MMO in. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. (laughs) So are they just like going through all of the Titan stuff that got built and being like, all right, let's see if we can make a game out of this. Maybe. I don't know. What else can we salvage from Titan? Yeah, I don't know. It will be interesting. And so oh. I was going to say, it's a very good thing that Grace has a new queen in Lilith. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because so... I'm, pre- I'm pretty sure your previous queen is, uh, yeah. Got uh, she got medicined. He doesn't even work there anymore. I, I mean. That's why she gets to be the new thrall. Well, is she, because is she thrall? Because thrall never became the villain. Is she the villain? She. We don't know sure, where she is. Sure looked like it. I mean, she she has a plan. She's been killing everyone in Azeroth to, you know, use them in some larger battle in the Shadowlands. She has a plan. I mean, I, I've 
pretty thoroughly checked out of Wow's story lately. But um, yeah, I don't know. I once upon a time having her be a key character for an expansion would have been the greatest thing ever. And right now, I just can't roll my eyes enough. I'm I am so deeply amused. Like they killed off one of the biggest names in the Horde side. Uh, And then, like, his death was supposed to be the way to unite the Horde and the Alliance, and all of the cutscenes sure seem to be pushing towards, hey, finally at last, the Horde and Alliance are fighting. And then in some discussions, I I think like in a press release, somebody's like, oh yeah, I know you all would really like to be friends with the Horde and Alliance, but nope, that's not going to happen. It's like, okay, that doesn't make sense. Your story makes no sense. Yeah. I mean, because they're kind of raid bossing, uh, uh, what's the priestess of a loon? Taranda. Taranda. Yeah. yeah. Why and how? So she basically prayed to a loon, uh, to the vengeful side of a loon, and became like a loon's side. You can stop now, I guess. Um, I don't really. Yeah. Really, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. Like so. So she's like you know this this avatar of a loon's wrath. I think calling it a story is pretty generous at this point. So, yeah. I mean, basically, they broke Ice Crown. Um, You know, she... Sylvanas went to go pay Bolvar Lich King a a, uh, visit. She killed Azeroth's greatest hero. And we we think for a few minutes in the cutscene that she's going to put on the crown. But no, she's going to tear apart the crown, which cracks a hole between the worlds and shadowlands is apparently upside down above ice crown stop me if you thought the end of wrath didn't make sense before yeah no so i realized that i'm the only one who's still paying attention to their story but wasn't that whole helmet thing the only thing stopping the undead scourge from completely destroying all of azeroth yeah correct (laughs) yeah yeah, the whole Jailer of the Damned thing. There isn't one now. Which was dumb. That was really dumb. We're we're on. It's it's dumb all the way down. Yeah. So so there there is no barrier between the the dead and the living, and we're going to the land of the dead. I feel like I'm on. Uh, I feel like I'm in like what is it the Wheel of Time series book like eight, where just like. Nothing makes sense anymore. We're just having problems, but nothing's actually changing. But still, problems are happening. I mean, here's the thing. Is it'll probably be a pretty good expansion? Because so far, Blizzard and WoW kind of have the Microsoft thing going on where every other one is pretty good. So... Really, though? I mean, like, Legion was pretty good. I actually liked Panda quite a bit. I hated Cataclysm. Warlords was hot garbage. So, I, yeah, I don't know that I'm going to be that generous. <laughs> I mean, you can say this is true if you accept Miss of Pandaria as being good. I, I, I actually liked Miss of Pandaria quite a bit. I mean, I, I mean, too. It had good but Miss of Pandaria is, actually, I'm not going to say where it went off the rails, but where it continued going off the rails. Yeah, Cataclysm is where it went off the rails, but Miss of Pandaria for me is, like, I was playing as a horde oh, hold, person. Hold on a sec. It went off the rails at the end of Wrath. That's fair. Yeah. You guys are way more generous than I am. (laughs) So I I do not remember Miss of Pandaria fondly because that was when all of our leaders were being incredibly stupid. Like that's that's really what I remember. Like I could no longer take any of the NPCs in WoW seriously throughout all of Miss of Pandaria. And like, and... I could, this is also, like, I realize that this is maybe a corner case, but, like, I do a lot of, like, sort of internal role-playing, and I have to be able to answer the question of, why is my character working for these people? And I was was having a hard time answering that question in Wrath. Mostly I was like, okay, I'm working for Sarfang, 
and sort of like me and Sarafang are here sort of thumbing our nose at Garrosh, but then like could not there was no pretense of that in uh mists. You were the bad guys doing the bad things because you were bad people. Yeah, I, I have no idea what it's gonna be like. I mean, I do like the fact that they're moving away from factional storyline again. I mean, because like you're you're it's, going it's, to be spending so, your it's time. So close, so so close. I know. Like you're, you're going to be spending your time in the land of the dead, and you're going to get to choose who you befriend in the land of the dead. So, like, yeah, I mean, that was that was okay. Like, I liked the class fantasy bit from like Legion, but I don't know. Like, it's. All I've ever really wanted is the faction wall to drop so that, you know, Grace can, you know, play her undead and, you know, I can play a dwarf and life can be grand and, and we can all, you know, loathe the stupid faction la- leaders together. Boy, do I, like, it is so, like, what was the point of Saurfang's death? I, okay, so that shit kind of pissed me off in a, in, in a not so low key way is what the hell is the deal like why why can we res some people but not other people like this is a world where resurrection magic is commonplace like we use it all the freaking time why the selective resing i mean i don't know i can i can actually be okay with the banshee queen is able to unresurrectably kill someone like sure whatever but for yeah, the story- okay, but you see, like, I can't even do that because, like, there's a whole cinematic where she literally eats the souls of an entire Alliance army. And, you know, Anduin just law res and brings oh. everyone back. So, like, yeah. I, can't even, I can't even say that. No. Well, I don't know. They're bad at writing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> They're bad at writing. True facts. I tried. Like, you know, that's the thing is like, okay, sure. Prior to that part of Battle for Azeroth, I could have been, yeah, Banshee Queen has has special magic that like y- you can't mess with. No, no, that has already played out and Anduin can fix it. Yet he chose not to fix it in this case. I, I still think for me, it's less like the mechanics and more the point of Sarafang's death. The reason why Sarafang died was like, to bring the Alliance and Horde together. To be this big moment where they could, like, unite and, like, the Alliance could see the Horde has been internally feuding. The leader, like, this vile leader of the Horde, Sylvanas, has just killed one of their great generals and has, like, abdicated. This was the moment for them to, like, see that understand that okay time to put our differences aside and work together like his death was the catalyst to bring the horde and lions together so if you're immediately like all right now we're gonna all fight again what was the point drama for a cool cutscene that you will then forget until it's time for the next cool cutscene well and like i don't know i i if if this were me i would have a sequence of events happened that caused the Alliance to basically abandon, you know, their leaders so that you end up with a group that is, you know, horde. reasonable Alliance leader. Well, most of them. Like, like get rid of the, 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 the people who are bloodthirsty and want war, and then everyone else can move on with their lives, and, you know, we can go fight bigger evils. But then it wouldn't be World of Warcraft. But... There are plenty of things to war against. That's it's true. Like, like we're totally going to have to war against more cosmic horrors, and I'm okay with that. It's not even like you would have to get rid of PvP, because, like, correct me if I'm wrong, most PvP is in arenas now, right? Like, and all it it's... takes is the same kind of hand-waving that happens in Destiny. That, like, PvP is to, you know, harden the warriors... You know, by by practicing against each other. It doesn't even need to be that. It's just an arena. Like, you fight for sport. Like, this is. There's battlegrounds still, and I don't understand why they can't just stick Chromie out in front and hand wave and say, time thing. 
Go back in time um, to when the Horde and Alliance fought each other. Yeah. Blah. Yep. I mean, that's what they did for the anniversary event. That's what they do in the Blasted Lands. They do it all over the place now. You can wander through multiple zones in, like, retail. Wow. Go find a bronze dragon and ask them to change which era of time it represents. I mean... This is totally going to work, except they have plans to make Chromia raid boss in, like, two patches. Man. Chromia Chrome is the purest thing ever. People they're probably going to skip directly to Nazgul. rage a lot. <laughs> no, 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 no. Chromia is Nazdormu, don't you see? Like, I mean, what? No. you can do whatever the hell you want to to Nazdormu. I could give a shit. <laughs> don't, don't touch Chromia. Chromia is pure. Yeah. He's the pure, innocent form of Nazdormu. No, go no. away. <laughs> we had a whole thing where we had to, you know, solve Chromie's murder. It turns out it was you all along. <laughs> so apparently there's a, t- there's a tower of Belgast. I mean, Torgast. <laughs> deepest tower? Yes, deepest tower. I mean, that sounds perfectly reasonable to me. Although, like, the thing that concerns me is WoW has done this for years where it steals ideas from other games and then kind of makes the worst possible version of them. (coughs) I'm looking at you, Transmog System. You are the shittiest version of a cosmetic system. (laughs) That's just because Blizzard doesn't like people that have fun. They are the fun people. I don't know if I'd call it worse than if at 14s. Yeah, I was going to say, 14 would like to talk to you. 14s is bad. Like y- at least, at least WoW has collecting of appearances. I mean, which I mean, technically, I guess you can sort of, but you only get a few slots. I filled up my commode real fast. I mean, my thing though is like cosmetics was a solved problem. They just needed to copy what lots of people had done, but now they WoWized it. Also, like there's no point to void storage now, and that still exists, <laughs> which was the worst version of getting more bank space. What, yeah, you don't like, like having to pay every time you put something in or take it out? I mean, it was the it was the just store the item database entry solution, which is, again, not becoming that uncommon. I got it. Like, I did not realize how much the item storage solution and, like, back-end database processes of a game really, really matters to my enjoyment. But, uh... Playing WoW and being able to, like, just throw stuff around really quickly feels very, like, it makes me manage my inventory, whereas in Final Fantasy XIV, it's the last thing I want to do, and I will do it when, like, I must and I hate it. Yeah, my, my, I, the problem with, the problem with fourteen and inventory management is they allowed me to buy my way out of the problem, which only made the problem worse. I have lots of retainers, and they're all full. But anyway, like, we've, we've run long at this point. Um, BlizzCon happened, you know, I think we largely talked about all the, the major things, so any final thoughts before we uh, close this off? I take the deafening silence as a no. Well... Hopefully you enjoyed the show, and uh, we will see you again next week. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Later, all. See you.